Welcome to the Visual Storytelling Podcast. My name is Fred Ranger, and I'm happy that you're joining us this week for another inspiring conversation. This week, I have a very special guest. I'm actually honored to have with me Kevin Kelly, who's not only what do you call a senior maverick at Wired Magazine, (laughs) but he's also uh, that he co-founded in 1993. And by the way, I'm a big fan of Wired Magazine. But he's also a photographer, a New York Times bestseller. He runs a popular website, podcast, newsletter that recommends cool tool. And he is the co-chair of the Long uh, Now Foundation, which has been building 500 foot tall clock that will tick for 10,000 years. You're doing so many cool things, Kevin. But first off, welcome to the show. (laughs) Well, thank you, Fred. I really appreciate your invitation to join you in chat. Thank you for your interest in my work, and I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. So, thank you, and thank you for being here. And and before we we dive into the the visual storytelling and the and the photography, uh, you 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 are a man of action. That's what I'm. That's what I'm seeing. That's what I'm reading. You're 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 involved in so many cool things. Uh, what 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 keeps you going like that? You've been you've been active for so so many years. What what motivates you? Uh, getting up in the morning and doing all these cool things. Uh, boy, it's fun. Um, I'd learn things. I'm a lifelong learner. I'd love to learn new things. I, um, my mission is to kind of spread opportunities around the world to as many people as possible. And I think technology helps do that. Um, I have a joy of the world and this short ride that we're on together. And part of what I want to do is share my joy at, the things I, uh, you know, like art and um, making things, uh, our environment. So, so, um, you know, f- for me, I've never had any trouble thinking about what I'm going to do today because there is a long list and my time here is very short and I have so many things I still want to do. So, yeah, m- maybe looking back, I can see I've done a lot, but man, I look ahead and see all the things I haven't done. <laughs> <laughs> this is so true, and and Kevin, um, you've been uh, traveling a lot over the years. Yeah. You've visited thirty five Asian countries, and I right. I, I want to bring you a little bit more towards the the photography aspect. Um, before we talk about Vanishing Asia, which is your your book that I yeah. that, that that seems very very interesting. Um, what actually brought you to photography in the first place, oh. and 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 why did you decide to pick up a camera to to tell visual yeah. stories? That's a really good question because I was, um, I've been a maker since I've been a little boy making really big or complicated and cool things, uh, which by the way, were never photographs. I don't have a single photograph of all the neat stuff I made, including a nature museum because photography back in those days, when I was growing up in the fifties and sixties, my parents had a little tiny brownie camera. They would have a 24 uh, exposure roll a black and white film that they would do one roll a year. So they would take 24 pictures every year. Wow. Maybe one at a couple at Christmas, maybe one at Easter, one for a birthday, maybe one at Halloween. And that was a roll. So the, the stuff I was making that didn't, <laughs> that never warranted a picture. And um, I became, Uh, I was kind of really interested in art, always making stuff, drawing, painting, um, you know, uh, pastels, all kinds of things. And uh, and I took all the art in class in uh, our schools I could. But I was also a science nerd and doubled up on all the science and math I possibly could because I loved science. And I built a chemistry lab, which there's no photographs of, in my basement to do chemistry experiments. And um, I couldn't decide to go whether to go to art school or kind of engineering school and I discovered photography in my senior year of high school That's how melded together my interest in the technical stuff and my interest in art and there was there was this nice kind of convergence of of the of the technical and the artistic you because at that time to do photography it was black and white you needed to do chemistry you had to of trays of chemicals you worked with and you had to do optics and there was just a lot of technical knowledge required 
to really make a very nice print. And um, that appealed to me and the art part of it. And so I, I, I guess this, this was sort of the perfect marriage of my kind of diverse interests. And it was just at the very, very beginning of when photography was sort of becoming popular. At that time, very few people still had cameras. And if they had one, it was just these point and shoot brownie cameras. But there was the very first um, SLRs coming around. They were rangefinders. My first cameras were little tiny rangefinders. And um, so, so um, I actually uh, was so into it. And, and, and I was self taught because that was the only way. That was literally the only way. Self taught meaning I would go to the library and try to find books about how to do this. And um, uh, it was kind of a struggle because, you know, getting information in those days was really tough. You had to find somebody. I did find a kid, another kid who could develop, and I watched him develop things. Oh, I get it. I can do that. And um, I, I went to uh, sign up for a workshop, photography residency workshop, after I dropped out of college to um, – to kind of really learn how to do it. And I did it every day. We each had our own workshop. It was kind of like an artist thing. I had a, a two by two of medium format camera by then. And um, so it was still kind of a fine art thing, but for me, it was, I just loved it. It was just the perfect combination of um, finding things and making things. This weird, this yeah. weird, thing where you are both creating something, but also finding it, hunting for it. And so, I don't know, there was everything about it really, really liked, I really liked about it, but I was doing kind of black and white abstract landscape kind of stuff. And were you immediately drawn by the art of photography or, or did you actually started to, you mentioned painting, you mentioned other form of art But when you put a camera in your hand, were you like, wow, okay, this is a way to express myself. This is a way to tell a story and so on. Yeah, I was doing fine art photography. You know, my heroes were, you know, not just Ansel Adams, but, you know, um, the, the, the photographers from the 70s, Paul Capernego, Harry, um, I can't remember his name now. Um, you know, the, the, the classic black and white, large format kind of photographers, you know, I liked Um, Robert Frank and his, his kind of work, but it was all mostly black and white, mostly um, what we consider kind of classic photography now, but it was art. It was art photography. It wasn't commercial. I really didn't have any much interest in the kind of the studio version of stuff. Um, and I kind of imagined, I mean, I didn't really, I wasn't doing this with the idea of following in a career. I mean, that would have been crazy. I didn't have no idea where it was going. I just wanted to do it as much as possible. And um, uh, I imagined, I guess, if I saw forward, that, that I would do this on the side. It would be kind of like my artistic fulfillment, my hobby, so to speak. That eventually maybe I would get a job and do something. And this would be the thing I could do because it was impossible to kind of imagine it doing it all the time. And I wasn't really sure I wanted to do it forever. But um, uh, my photography took a little uh, bend in things when um, I had a chance to travel and I decided to um, try color. And the option was kind of color slides, kind of National Geographic type of thing. And there, then that was a different mode, a different stance, a different art, basically. And um, since then, I, ha I haven't done any black and white, large format landscaping abstraction since then. But, you know, that never leaves me the kind of influence I had. So, um, and that was an entirely different thing. That's sort of wrapped up in this exploring the whole thing of Asia, the documentation, uh, the recording. It was, it was a very different thing. But the only thing that was the same was that there was a camera <laughs> at the heart of it. And um, uh, it was, again, there was more potential for, for, for a, a career because, in fact, um, 
when I was uh, 20, let's see, how old was I? About, probably about 19. I was going to set off to go to Taiwan. I had an opportunity to visit a friend who was there, and I wanted to photograph. I didn't know what, but I was going to photograph. I thought, I'd like to be a National Geographic photographer. So I was 19. I looked up in the phone book. I found National Geographic's number. I found the name and looking at the magazine of a photo editor. I was smart enough to figure out that. I called the photo editor. I said, you know, I'm 19 years old, whatever it is. I'm going to Taiwan and Japan. Do you need any photographs? I'm going to photograph for you. And his what name did, was What Bruce did he say? <laughs> he said, well, he says, you know, it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it doesn't work That's that artist, way. 19 years old, who's going to Taiwan. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Send us your it pictures. It doesn't really work that way. But he said the thing. But when you're back, come show me your photographs which I did. I took a train. I was in New Jersey. I took a train down. To, when I came on my first trip, when I came back, I, I, I came down and showed him my work and he was very encouraging. And I went out again. He's, you know, he said, you, you know, it's a good start. It's a good start. Um, you need to take more pictures. So I, I went out again and I went down and came, came back and showed him even more. And, um, uh, I could have, and at one point, eventually, I went out, and eventually, he asked me for some some pictures because they were working on a picture of the Himalayas, and I had been photographing in the Himalayas, and they had a set that they wanted to see of mine, and um, they didn't wind up using it, but that was the path, and that's how the path works. The path works: you cultivate something, you do years and years of starting a relationship with editors and people. And you, over time, win their confidence and, and so forth. So if I had continued that, I probably would have you know, eventually got an assignment at National Geographic. But here's what happened in between. You started your own magazine. <laughs> no, that's okay. later. That's later. <laughs> well, before that, but I met people on assignment for the magazines, photographers, in my travels. And I didn't feel that they were very happy about it. Yeah. They seemed to be, it was too much like a job. It was, it was, they were photographing what they had to photograph. That's what I felt. It's like they were, they weren't really photographing what interests them. They were photographing on assignment for someone else, kind of, so to speak. And that, that sense of being a job and not really having that kind of control didn't really appeal to me. And so I, I didn't really follow up with that. I decided, well, maybe someday I'll make my own book out of this, and that would be enough. And um, so the prospect of kind of being a professional photographer, um, I, I saw what it was, and I could have gone down that path, but it didn't seem like the path that I wanted to to go down and in terms of giving me the kind of satisfaction that I was looking for. Yeah, I can, I can see uh, that in speaking with a lot of uh, photographers on assignment. It, it, you know, the common theme is that at some point it does feel like a job and some people actually get burned out like in any type of work, but uh, some people actually uh, look at their camera and get stressed just by the, by looking <laughs> at it. So, so yeah, so it's never a perfect and it's never a, it's not a perfect yeah. science. Uh, the thing though that I'm that I'm interested in is is learning a little bit more about the body of work of that book, Vanishing Asia. So uh, was that taken over the course of you know decades? And, and there's a page where you show all the cameras that you used, and that's yeah, yeah. Uh, that's very impressive. Some some pretty beat up cameras in there. Some old, you know, I'm guessing Nikon's because you, you did blur the, uh, the, the 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 logo. Some old Canon's Lumix, some point and shoot. So. Uh, just by the look of the cameras, it looks like you've used a, a plethora of camera over the years. So was that yeah. body of work over uh, decades? Yeah. So I was photographing the contents of this book basically over 50 years, five decades. Wow. And I started off with film slides. I carried two bodies. And I never had a professional camera. I've never owned a professional camera. When I first started off, I could only afford uh, Nikromats, which were the kind of low-end consumer um, brand of Nikon. 
So I couldn't even afford a Nikon. And um, uh, then I later on graduated to shooting um, uh, uh, film cameras like um, a Canon. I had a Canon, cheap Canon amateur camera. Like the Rebel thing, yeah. Yeah, and then when I, yeah, a Rebel, or Rebel, what are they called? Yeah, and then then I went to um, some point and shoot cameras because I was lazy and I just didn't want to carry the big cameras anymore literally point and shoots. So some of those images are from point and shoot cameras. And then I, when digital came out, I started going with this little tiny digitals. I went with Lumixes and kept with them as I kind of grew. And I did the zoom super zooms, which were basically point and shoots. And so, um, yeah, so, so, so everything was shot on basically consumer level or if not even below consumer level and amateur level cameras. And so I never had a very big fixation on the camera gear itself. I just felt that it was not that crucial. The images were more important for most images. You're unless you can blow them up to the wall size thing that, you know, you're not really going to see that there is something about having a really crisp lens and all that stuff. That does, but it's not, I would say, essential. It's sort of for what you're doing. So anyway, I I, I did a I laid out all the cameras which I kept, and um, the early ones, like the Nikromets, were incredibly banged up. Um, they were kind of like workhorses. You can see very, the brassing um, on on some of them. Right? Yeah, the brass <laughs> is showing through. They were all manual focus, manual exposure. Um, which was a problem because there's no screen. You don't know what you're getting. I'm not developing until months and months later. And um, it's really hard to, to learn that way. And you have to kind of trust them to some extent. So, um, so that, 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 that was the word I want, that practice, the, the, the discipline. I, I, I actually am not a very good, craftsmen in that respect um there there are there are people who um could squeeze even more out of these cameras than i could um once autofocus came along i totally relied on it um for better and worse and lots of times it was worse and so um uh so i don't consider my craftsmanship to be um, much above average, but the kinds of things that I was after, it was adequate for for that. Yeah, and um, I was going f- kind of like a s- photojournalistic kind of street photography style, a little bit naturally ge- geographic of uh, capturing a scene, trying to get the entire feeling and the ambiance and the textures and uh, yet still have a kind of a composition that was arresting. And so for that, the, the quality issues was, was as long as it was kind of like in focus, not blurry <laughs> enough light. Yeah. You had the sense of being there kind of all available light you were being there. And that was what I was trying to capture. So, so I, I can definitely, um, attest to it. I mean, I'm looking at the images in the book and, uh, it's all about the story, right? So it's all about the visual story that you're telling and right. you were and are very successful at that because you get immersed. That's, that's the word that comes to right. mind. You get immersed in the photos. And to your point, uh, I've never been to these uh, part of the world, but I feel like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm living yep. a, a little tiny bit of, uh, of what's happening there and the, the look and the feel like and almost smell, you know, some, some of the, <laughs> some, uh, yeah. some of these scenes that you, that you captured. Um, yeah, you can. Yeah. And, 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 and what I was looking for to me, the success of these was if I could get to a place where it, you could smell it, where, where, where there everything about. So, so my ideal picture was a picture that was so rooted in place that it could have only have been taken there. You nice. look at that and you say, oh, that's, you know, that's Varanasi, India, or that's, you know, Ladakh. The, the Hemis, it had to be there, but you couldn't fake it. You couldn't 
be somewhere else. It would it was so rooted in, in terms of the costume, the lighting, the textures on the wall, all the little details. They were very very place oriented of that time and that culture, and that was when for me the, the photo succeeded. What, what- all of that without having to capture a landmark or something very obvious, right? right? right. It's about the people. It's about the the, the right. way they live. And, and again, I, I, I'm very impressed by, uh, and I'm I'm actually even more impressed by uh, by uh, what you've been able to, like you said, squeeze into those like one inch <laughs> Lumix uh, cameras yeah. or, or or even film. I mean, this is this is brilliant work, and and the exposure is, is yeah. Awesome. So so yeah. Uh, you know, for the photographers today, so I was shooting on. Uh, mostly um, Kodachrome 64. Wow. So I'm shooting ISO 64, so, available light in the dark. <laughs> It's like... You are oh, a very so steady hands. steady hands, right? <laughs> to be able steady to hands. pull that. Yeah, because like, you know, a 30th of a second, maybe down to an eighth if I'm lucky, 16th. Wow. And, and um, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, a big... Uh, jumpy uh, shutter, um, and, and then uh, today's digital stuff is sees in the dark, basically. Sees in the dark, yeah. stabilized I sensor. Would killed, <laughs> I would have killed for that kind of of sensitivity. Oh my gosh, so much I could have. There was a lot that I just simply couldn't so, photograph. Because so, so, so Kevin, no, no more shooting film for you. You don't. You don't. Uh, you don't feel like no, you're, no. no? You're, you're dead. Never, never. I, I I am completely baffled by people who think they want to go back to film. I would never, ever, ever, ever go back to film. I mean, you, 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 you found it wired. You know about trends, right? So I'm pretty yeah. sure you're aware of the latest trends where yeah. you buy a little Leica M6 for $4,000, which is yeah. mind-boggling already. But then you buy a roll of film that's $25, and then you get it developed for $16. Like, this is crazy. And by the yeah. way, I'm part of the problem because I do shoot my M6 because I like it, because sure. it's film and this and that. But I, I, I don't agree with the trend. And maybe it's me getting yeah, yeah. older and saying, right. why are you a bunch of kids on TikTok buying film cameras for six grand and paying yeah. 30 bucks for film? Like, I, I, don't, I don't get it. Yeah. So my, my son actually dabbled in that for a little while. I took some of my cameras and stuff, and that was fine. I actually had some leftover rolls of film that were like ancient that he was using. Well, you know um, what? Expired film, Kevin. You can sell that on eBay for more than ever. <laughs> Really? Yeah. People are paying oh, more to, boy, to get expired. I, I, I just I just gave him I just gave him my you know my original rolls of Kodachrome and all that kind of stuff. But you can't can uh, you develop Kodachrome in twenty twenty three? I'm not sure. I don't I have no idea. That's why I don't yeah. I don't know. Um <laughs> but um I uh this was not this year, this was a couple of years ago. Um okay. but uh yeah, I mean but here's the thing is is that the you know, you're probably averaging maybe five bucks in exposure. Yeah. But that's actually, in real dollars, what it was costing me at that time. Oh, yeah. So it was that expensive to, that expensive, to shoot? Relatively. It was, you know, in terms of the, 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 the real kind of the, the inflation-adjusted cost at that time yeah. was like $5 per, per exposure. And so each time I was exposing it, it was like five bucks. Is this going to be worth five bucks? And so I was very, very stingy. In what I was photographing, and yet I was photographing live events that you know there was no redoing them. It was like live events, like in one shot. There's no motorized shutters. It's yeah. like it's a decisive moment. I kind of like is it, you know is it now or is it going to be an hour from now? I don't know. I got to shoot it right now. So um, that was the discipline, and that was the joy for me. Was you know, it's actually how few pictures I was taking given what I was seeing and just really trying to wait for that exact second because I had only, it's going to cost $5 to shoot it. You, you have One, a Cartier-Bresson in the back of your head saying, this, is this the decisive moment? Is this the decisive moment? Wait, 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 wait. Uh, okay, you know, it's like yeah. you're kind of getting there because you can't go, you can't just roll it off like a machine gun. Yeah. And so, um, so that discipline was part of the joy of the hunting. It was like having a, you know, I'm not going to use my shot to Hamilton thing. So you have to kind of really wait. And that, that was part of the, um, 
the hunt yeah. that was part of the thrill in my in my time even with digital at the, when digital was first coming the issue was was card size this yeah. is filling up cards and um batteries so um the the era now when people are taking hundreds of photographs a day on your phone it's it was, it's a different it's an entirely different medium now but I mean, you've you've literally co-founded Wired, and 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 you've worked there, and you've seen trends and technology evolve. Um, are you? Do you see evolution of technology as always being a positive thing? Uh, you've yeah. covered a lot of I mean, technologies, or, or or sometimes do you feel a bit? I know I do, a bit nostalgic about how things no, were working in the past. I don't feel nostalgic at all. Good, good riddance. Good. I like um, it. <laughs> so, so no, generally it's, it's positive. The AI stuff now, photography is amazing. Um, we're going to see, I mean, what they can do computationally photography is just astounding. Photoshop is just great. Super. The only problem I have with Photoshop is I don't have enough time to use it. So yeah. <laughs> you these 9,000 images and they each were touched in some ways, just a little thing but um i have no version to photoshopping things but i just don't have the time to do it yeah so they weren't really photoshopped um and i think they're yeah i think it's we're moving forward it's it's really fantastic uh i really look forward to what's going to happen next so, so you did touch upon something interesting and and you're probably the first photographer who welcomes ai with open arms open eyes and open mm -hmm. ears i would say even an open heart um and I want to learn more about your, your, again, I'm, I'm asking Kevin, the, yeah, uh, yeah. the photographer, but also the technologist. So, so, right, right. and we've seen a lot of good things come out of AI, but also a lot of, you know, fake stuff and, and people minting and NFTing some images that were produced by AI. So what's your, what's your view on where photography and is going through an AI context? Yeah. So it's early days. It's like, we're a couple of months into it. So this is like a baby infant. We're saying, what's, What is the baby good for? Well, it's going to be really tough to ascertain what the baby is good for after a couple of months. Um, I've been using the um, image generators since June, so that's about almost a year, 11, 10 months, and um, trying to do something every day. Um, and their assistants, the, 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 these, these generative AIs are what I call UPIs, Universal Personal Interns, They are interns that will do things for you. They're really great. The tools are quickly being built into everything. I just I just got my um, uh, Google Bard invite, so I'm playing nice. around with Google Bard, and um, they'll be everywhere. And they're 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 interns, so you have to check their work. You kind of work with them. They're not going to do it by themselves. You're you're going to always do stuff with them. Um, they'll be already built into Photoshop, so you can kind of use as much AI as you want. Um, to repair things, fix things, you know, all kinds of ways. And that's, and that's what they are. So um, they can make up a, a, a very photorealistic image, like a photo. And what's interesting is um, you can't, you're, you're unlikely to, 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 it's sort of embarrassing to release the work of the intern untouched, right? People can tell. Hmm. And, and as we get better, we can tell more and more. And so, um, And, 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 you know, the early painters in the 1800s were really concerned about the invention of photography because they said, all you, have to, all you do is just push the button and you get this thing. Well, <laughs> we just know that photography is not just pushing the button. Yeah. We talked about um, this kind of hunt and this, 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 this uh, there, there's a work, there's an art, and it's not just pushing the button. Pushing the button is part of it, but there's so much more that goes into making, finding, creating a great photograph. And it's the same thing with AI. Yeah, you can click and get something, but that's not going to be enough as we go on. There's 30 million of these images produced every day now. 30 million brand new, never before seen images that will disappear and never be seen again. And to 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 make something good, you have to kind of you have to prompt engineer, you have to work around and back and forth this conversation and I do a piece of art every day uh, before I was doing it by hand. And I would spend uh, half an hour, maybe sometimes an hour, maybe sometimes an hour and a half, but somewhere in that area of working on it. 
And I can spend at least a half an hour now working with some AIs to try and get something that I would be willing to be happy with. So it's a conversation going mm-hmm. around and around. And it's not just, yeah, they can do something, but it's not going to be great. It's not going to be good. And so, um, so, so, so this, this kind of working with us as a tool will become embedded in, in, in the general process, much like Photoshop is, but there'll be, it'll be much smarter and there's a creativity to it. That's the, that's the thing we want to remember is that there is a lowercase creativity. There's actual creativity. Your intern can be creative with you, but it's a different alien kind of creation. It's like an alien being from another planet. And so that's good because together you and your alien intern can work to produce something that you couldn't by yourselves or the alien couldn't by themselves. And that's the stance that we're going to be having. Um, and some of this will even eventually be built into the camera itself. I was been talking to some people who are making the next version of phone cameras and they're talking about like autocorrect inside the camera, all kinds of things. So we'll embed some of the AI stuff right into the camera. So it's live and it's kind of talking back to you. Like, what you a little bit or, you know, um, you know uh, how about if we, you know, and flip this uh, symmetrically or whatever. So I think, um, I'm excited about that because what it means is that we have some new powers that we can use to create things. There will always be the option to do everything by hand so you don't do manipulations, just as there are people who today who use big view cameras when they could be digital and there are people on film. That's fine. Good. Good for them. Um, there will always be that option for those who, who want to have the unretouched version of things. Fine. There will be places where you can share images, photographs that have no AI in them at all, fine. But most of the images are going to be somehow touched by AI, just as they're mostly touched by something like Photoshop these days. Yeah, I think you're making a very good point in um, augmenting you know, the work you yeah. can do through AI and having an interaction, getting to learn uh, more about what it can do what it could do and what right. you know what the future can offer for this type of technology but i think if you are a working photographer today and you're a young photographer maybe you're 25 you're starting yeah, off your yeah. career you're looking at this you're like i might have to adapt and very fast because the traditional work of being a photographer you mentioned national geographic you mentioned you know, uh, uh, being a, being a working photographer on assignment, right. that might change <laughs> that, that, that profession. And you and I are not, are, 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 we're not pro yeah, photographers yeah. doing weddings. So it's a very different environment uh, that we're in, but still that's that it, it it's going to revolutionize just like other industries, but it's going to revolutionize the, the, right, the, right, right. the work of photo like working photographers, you know? Right. So, so here's where I could, uh, 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 like you said, wedding photography. So here's the way AI, might impact wedding photography. And I'm just making this up on the spur of the moment right now. But it might be that, uh, and this is what AIs can do, is that you shoot as a wedding photographer, you shoot and you do your best. But the AI can actually reshoot your own images. Like you go back and you say, oh, I wish, you know, I was shifted over here by two feet. I should have done that. I didn't think of it. The AI will do that for you. It'll look exactly perfect. You shot the thing it worked on, but it's just going to shift everything. Or, I mean, you know, it, it can do like, um, uh, or even, you know, you show them and the, the client decides that they want something different. And so they reshoot it from the existing photographs that you shot. You could reshoot things, literally, and it will look like it was shot from, five feet away with the same lighting and the same everything. It's just going to re-crunch them and re-render them and as if it was five feet away or different lighting or something. So there's there, there, there will be ways in which, you know, you're working with the AI, you're there shooting to get the core material that's then going to be re-shot 
by an AI in this kind of ideal way that could could then be tweaked and made different. Like you could you could say after after the wedding, you could say, oh, "Well, you know, I didn't like my dress. Give me a different <laughs> dress." Okay, sure, fine. We'll do that. Yeah. And so, um, and so, I think there's there's all kinds of new possibilities that we haven't had. And this is what technology gives us, without taking away too many of the old ones. Um, so if, again, if you wanted someone to shoot on film, they're going to shoot on film, a little range finder camera, your wedding. Okay, you can have that if that was really what you wanted. But you can also have this weird other thing where they're shooting things and it could be recast and you could change your, your dresses and you could change the, the period, uh, the time period. And, and that's also going to be possible. Yeah, that's uh, it's a very interesting uh, uh, thought because – doesn't it remove a bit of the, you know, human contribution versus like having a good eye and seeing the good light? If you can fix all of that in quote no, unquote it, post AI post, you know what I mean? No, it, it doesn't. That's that's the whole point. Is that you still have to eye? You still have to decide what it is, and um, it's it's sort of like it's, it's you become more like a film director. You become like a film director or, or a conductor. You are conducting. This thing you're you're making a larger scale vision of what it is, and you have lots of different people that are working for them. Some of them are just agents or AIs, and they're they're working for you. And you still have you 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 actually have even more choices. You have even more overwhelming choices of which way to go, and you have to navigate. You, the artist, have to navigate your way through and make all these choices that you didn't even have to make before in order to produce something. And so. You still need that eye. You still have to recognize something. You still have to have a vision of what it is that you're trying to say. All these things still apply, but it's in kind of a bigger space of choices to make. And so it's like you're a film director. The film director is an artist. They are responsible for that view, and they might direct the cinematographer, who is a human, making their own decisions and suggestions. But you're saying, no, no, no. The one I want is like this. This is the feeling I want. This is what it is. And then they they go and do that. And so you still need to do that with the A's. Like, this is what I'm saying. It's it's like you can't have your interns being the directors right now. I agree. I agree. Is the uh, I'm looking at your, your Twitter feed. Is the, uh, the 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 image of the the guy cooking pancakes? I think was that done through yeah. AI? Yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah, it's pretty, was, pretty so impressive. So you know, every day I post something. If you go back, all the all the ones I'm posting are all AIs, and I'm kind of exploring different ways. The, the one of the kind of common problems with AI is they like to add way too much detail. Yeah, and part of what I'm always doing is trying to pull them back to simplify them to make to to make it kind of simpler and a little bit more graphic, and what I would call graphic or bold. Because they have a tendency, they, the AIs right now, have a tendency to add tons and tons of detail. And um, it's a little bit evident, I guess I should say. So simplifying them is actually what I spend a lot of my time trying to do to get that right balance of enough detail to make it interesting, but not you be overwhelmed. Um, so that one that you're mentioning, which people can look up, is a little bit more photographic in its yeah. um, appearance, or it could be like a Vermeer kind of painting very close to there. And that's the joy for me, is that you can get things that are in between a photograph and a painting, right? With that, that new space that's in between, it's photographic in its sensibility, but there's a painterly aspect too, which is really, really wonderful. Um, and so, um, again, you can kind of direct these to say, I want something that's more photographic or I want something that looks more like a painting. And that space in between is a brand new, a brand new area where artists can explore. That's very impressive. And that AI generated image uh, makes me excited about the future and also um, poses some questions around deep fakes, right? So uh, again, I'm, I, I know you're, you're, you're a tech yeah, guy, yeah. so I can talk about these things. Usually it's more about yeah. the photography and it, it, it is about the photography because this is changing Uh, sure. the way we, we look at images are right. all, and you and I are, are, I'm not saying that I'm as 
mm-hmm. knowledgeable as you on, on on the topic, but I'm pretty familiar with the matter. But somebody, I'm thinking about my mother and some of my friends. Not everybody knows that. Hey, this might be a fake image. This might be, you know, right, in the right. past you could tell when it's photoshopped right, and stuff. Right. Now I'm looking at this image that you posted, and I'm like, somebody might take that for a real image. <laughs> you know, right, exactly. So in most cases, it doesn't really matter. But in some places, it matters tremendously, and that's like in news. News, politics, yeah. News, politics, yeah. So there there it does matter, and there are ways to tell. There are AIs that can tell whether something is an AI. And there we, the, for, there we wanted, uh, the only way to really tell is whether you can trust the source. And so I think uh, the news agencies will have policies and we'll broadcast and make transparent what those policies are. And that kind of disclosure is vital and important. But there's other cases, like in terms of art, where we don't really care. Yeah. Um, and Or I can say a movie. I don't care whether it's CGI or the actual actor. In fact, we can't really tell. And that's perfectly fine. I don't, I have no, I'm not, I'm not pissed off that they may use a CG character instead of a stunt person. I don't care. And so there's a lot of this in the realm where it doesn't really matter. The F, the, 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 the real expert might be able to detect right now. You just look at the hands and fingers and you can tell whether something is AI, but that won't be true for long. But there'll be I, other ways to tell. I, I saw your comment to a, a reply to a guy is that always check the hands and the fingers. <laughs> I right. thought that was interesting. Yeah. Um, that's true right now. Not all, won't always be true. And um, I think that the um, for 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 most cases, it's you know it's very similar to right right now. Do we care whether a picture has been photoshopped or not? And yeah, um, it depends on the context, like you said. Dep- depends on the context. Yeah, depends on the context. We can make deep face with Photoshop before, but it was just a lot of work and yeah. a lot of skill. Now it doesn't. But there was the same issue with like, well, for some kinds, it, 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 it didn't matter. In other cases where they're causing mischief of, of real people, the thing is going to be, do you trust the source? If it's some guy on the internet who's making it, I would not trust it. If it was the New York Times saying that this is an actual photograph, okay, if the New York Times is reliable and we can trust it, then all right, then then that's going to be real. So I think we're going to have disclosures, and I think that's good. Um, so I'm not really worried about it. it. It's it's for me, it's a tractable problem. It's a problem we can see the solution to. I think it's just a matter of whether we have the will to do it. Yeah, and I mean, you you've shot an entire book of real stories of real human beings right. and so on and so forth. And, and um, now, now we're looking at this. Are, are, are you the type of person who will embrace this to the point that you'll stop taking images with a camera and you'll, you'll invest all your time effort in this new tech or are you going to keep a balance? I'm, I'm interested in learning more on that. So, so I, I just said, I made a, a piece of art every day for a year by hand. Yep. And one of the things I try to do with that daily art, was to surprise myself. I would have no idea when I sat down what I was going to do. And I actually enjoy multimedia. So sometimes I would do things like pastels or like a watercolor, or I would do just a diagram or pen and ink drawing. So I like myself. You're asking me about my own work. I enjoy playing around with as many different medium as possible. So I will continue to make straight photographs that are untouched by anything. And at the same time or the next day, I will use something that's only been going through the AI and and everything in between. So I, I personally enjoy those different mediums and those different possibilities and playing around with them and seeing where they go. So that's, that's what I do. If, if, and, and that's actually, by the way, not a very good if you want to be a professional artist because the truth is that you want to evolve a style that people can identify with and, and, and that helps you sell things or help you sell your work and help you get yeah. assignments if you have certain things. And I don't, I'm going in the opposite direction. 
you look at what am I can't tell that I did it. It's I don't have enough of a style. So 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 um, my my approach to art is not what I would call very professional in that sense. Okay, but, but very a, liberating. A, if you don't I'm, have, I'm, a, I'm an amateur, and I and I'm <laughs> and I'm celebrating the amateurness that I get to play in lots of different media, creating things in many different varieties. And that's my pleasure. What, what, wasn't it Elliot Erwitt who said, I'm a professional amateur? I think it was, I think yeah. it was him who said that. That's good. Okay, I'm a professional amateur. I like that. Uh, that's what go. I am. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, 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 so um, uh, if you want to be a professional, you probably can't afford that kind of uh, freedom to do that. You probably, you have to kind of work a little bit more in developing an identifiable style that um, people can come to to uh, associate with you. And so um, I'm not trying to do that. Um, I don't know. You can tell me looking at my Vanishing Asia book, you know, is there a style there? Maybe. Mm-hmm. It's not. That's not what it's about. It's really not about kind of a distinctive manner, although – the one thing I would say is that the design of a book is unique. There's not a single book in the world that's anything like this book. Yeah, you have edge to no edge white, on each side. No white spaces. Exactly. Every page is unique design arrangement, uh, and it's all suited to what the content is. Um, there are little numbered captions. And so um, so I would say, if anything, the style is in actually the whole of the book itself. There's a certain thing, and all the books that I do are like that. There's no white spaces; everything's crammed to the edges. That's kind of my my style. So, so my style is a kind of a higher level, I guess, in the, in its arrangement and packaging. So it's a it's an editing slash sequencing yeah. style, right? And I'm, I'm a born editor. Yeah, I love editing. I love that selection, even in my own books. That package ideas Wired was about the packaging and stuff, and so that's that's where my style is. What's the one thing you learn through doing that book? And and I know there might be wow. multiple things you've learned, but what's the one? What's your one takeaway after this whole process? And by the way, for folks uh, uh, who are listening to this, I'll put a link to uh, the book, or should I say, the collection of books uh, yeah. that uh, Kevin ha- has put out because it's uh, a, a, I'm guessing a tremendous amount of work, not only to shoot it over forty years. But to sequence it, to edit it, to assemble it, to make all those yeah. decisions, what's the one thing that you come up with, come out with after doing all this this effort and, and work? Yeah, well, 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 thank you for that. It is actually over 50 years. And um, just the thing about it is, you know, there's 9,000 of my best photographs are there. And um, I was standing behind the camera in each one of these pictures. So just the physical journey of being there being there was a huge part of my life of like going to the end of the road and waiting around for that thing to happen and then having the patience to stand there and capture that and then you know going on to the next village whatever so that was that was just a huge amount of work and there was at the time no economic reason for me to do this there was no Yeah, because you had a full-time job, right? You were not a photographer, like you said. I was not a photographer. This was a full-time hobby in the sense that I was doing, I was going there for businesses, and whenever I would do a business trip, I would always piggyback on another week to go out into the boonies in Cambodia or into Oman or somewhere and just head out to try and discover these little pockets where there is still this culture being retained and to try and photograph it. And so... Um, So there was, yeah, so that is this huge amount of work. And then there's the photo processing and keeping track of everything and trying not to have duplicates and, mm-hmm. um, and, and uh, you know, touching each photograph just to make sure that it was um, at its best. Uh, and then the design of it, which took a year of, of, of work where wow. I did the design of every page. You did it design. yourself, uh, Kevin? I did it myself. Wow. The entire okay. thing. And all the color correction and everything. I did everything. And that was a joy. I did it because I loved this puzzle of getting the pieces and trying to make them fit and 
uh, say something, tell a story. And then I did the, the captions, 9,000 captions, which are mostly labels about where they are. And, 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 and after 50 years, maybe the one thing I kind of regret, but I don't know, it's just not me, was having better notes oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, where these things are. So I was Googling the entire time trying to re- recover where I was at that particular time. And, and the honest answer was I often literally did not know where I was even at that time. <laughs> Because places like northern northern Afghanistan, there wasn't any maps. There was just there was nothing. I mean, it was it was. I didn't know exactly where I was. So um, uh, that's you know, of course, now with GPS, I, yeah. I started to do that. I started to do my GPS log of where I was, so I could tell that. But that was not available. So that's a lot of work. What did I learn from all that? Um, I learned um, I was reminded about how much has the title of the book, how much has vanished, how much has changed. Mm. Um, one of the little one of the little um, tales or, or tells tells one of the little clues about um, the, the, the distance of how we have um, how modern we are. Is I could tell, I could tell the I could tell the pictures that were taken 50 years ago from the pictures that were taken recently, and, and there was one. Besides, sometimes the costumes were were prevalent, but they were kind of the same costumes. But there was one thing that really was different, and that was um, whether people in the city had bare feet or not. Uh huh. Because there was a moment when. Most everybody was bare feet, even if they were in a city. And that was how recent this kind of development was, because shoes were just a luxury. Hmm. Shoes were wow. luxury for most of history. Kids, especially, very rarely had shoes, in, in part because they would just outgrow them so fast, or they would just mangle them up. So kids very, very rarely would ever have shoes, including kids going to school. And so... um and not just in rural areas, even in urban areas. And so if there was an urban scene and there were people in bare feet, that was the old times. <laughs> and so I was kind of reminded, and uh, what I learned was um, the kind of immense amount of distance that we have gone in the modern world, what we have put behind us, where we have gone, that, that you know, some of the places I photographed are just like literally the most futuristic cities now. And um, the people there have no regrets, or I should say they're going to go back to the old way. They may have some some regrets, but they're basically fully committed to going forward. They're not going back. And um, so I was again reminded again and again of, of, of that distance and how – Within my own lifetime, how how much of the world has made that leap forward, and um, and maybe even some extent to why why they they left the villages to come into the cities, because if I was in their shoes or not shoes, if I was in their feet, no I shoes. Would do the same thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and 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 the sum of all this experience, uh, Kevin. Did that also help uh, you to literally publish another book, which is uh, The Life Essentials from a Skilled Navigator in Uncertain Time? Um, is that is it the sum of all of your experience that led to writing oh, yeah. a, a book like that, which has nothing to do with photography, but a lot to do with you right. know personal growth and, 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 and the stories right. you go through? Yeah, so I have a new tiny book, unlike the big Asian books, which are, too big to even lift up by yourself. <laughs> um, this is a little tiny paperback. Well, it'll be a hardcover when it comes out of little bits of wisdom that I wish I knew when I was younger. And yes, a lot of it came from travel. There is some actually travel advice in it too, but there's a little, some advice about careers, about becoming happy, satisfying lives, 
good, the, making the good life, about creating, being a creator, about being an artist, about learning how to do things. Like I, one of the things I didn't know when I was younger that I wish I knew was this idea of the necessity of redoing things again and again. Mm. So like the, the Vanishing Asia book, I made, or I guess I should maybe show it, I made a series of prototypes, books, including a, a smaller one that was made just for a black and white a Xerox pages that I hand bound myself into a book with a cloth binding to just figure out some of the uh, beginning pages and how it all fit together and everything. And then that seemed to work. And then I made a bigger version of the book, the same scale of the pages that I paid someone to do color Xerox prints of. And I sent it to a traditional bookbinder in Oakland and they made this humongous, I don't know if I can reach for it, humongous bound copy of the book as a prototype. And I realized it's just too big. It, I have to, I have to do something. It's just, I can't, I can't even lift it. And so, so I, I, I've come to understand that that kind of prototyping of your life, rather than making big plans, trying things out, having to make things and remake things that if you're making a chair, or whatever it is, you kind of make it one of them probably with the idea they're going to throw it away and make the better one doing a first draft of a book and then throwing away and redoing it. This idea that you have to make something great and good by redoing it again and again, by prototyping, by iterating it and having that kind of uh, generosity in your spirit to be able to keep doing that, that that's sort of essential. I wished I knew that when I was younger mm. because I kind of like the idea of like making something and throwing it away was like, whoa, I don't, that, 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 that seemed to me to be the mark of an amateur. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually the opposite. It's, it's not you watching YouTube, whatever you can see, the really great craftsmen there, they're always redoing things. They're always making things over. That's actually the sign of the professional. And so, um, that's the kinds of things that um, I talk about in this book that I wish I'd known was the, um, the necessity of prototyping your life rather than doing these big uh, grand gestures. Well, I, I, I think this is uh, very, very uh, timely because there's a lot of people right now, especially uh, you know, with the past three years we just went through for obvious reasons. There's a lot of people who, yeah. um, you know, are, are asking them, themselves, why, why am I even here? Where am I going? How am I, how am I going to get back to, you know, living a life that's, that I feel fulfilled in and so on and so forth. And especially, especially creative people, uh, who have been, as, as you can imagine, um, some 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 people lost their 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 their, their job some people lost their yeah. income some people you know decided to abandon the craft because it was too hard uh so i think this book uh, comes in at a very good time and uh, i'm actually considering uh, picking it up myself because i, I i'm always uh, i'm always uh, open to uh uh to, to learning more from from people like you who've been through a lot of experiences and also have a, a good word of wisdom to uh, to share so uh so that's uh that's a very nice, uh, very nice book, and I'll put a link in the show notes so people can actually. Well, thank you. I, I, I really appreciate it. I, I think I just end with the last bit of advice in the book, which yep. is um, your goal in life is to be able to say on the day before you die that you have fully become yourself. Mm. And I think that is my hope, and my mission in life is to enable people, born yet unborn, around the world, to have the, all the opportunities that they need, all the tools that they need to fully become themselves, to find their tiny little ability, their genius. Everybody has unique face. Everybody has a unique set of skills and, and geniuses to be able to share those with others to fulfill themselves and, our, and ourselves. And that, that kind of desire to increase the opportunities and the possibilities in the world, that's why I like technology is that it generally adds more ways to do things rather than less so we have all these new ways and we still have the old ways for those who want them um and so i want to kind of expand that hoping that every person alive and yet born will be able to find a way to express their their genius wow so that's my that's my mission 
Thank you for your your presence here, your questions, your enthusiasm for my work. I greatly appreciate it. Well, you know what, Kevin? It's been such an inspiring conversation. I feel that this is the first conversation of many. If you don't mind, I, I, I really want to continue at some point. And I'm sure the listeners of this podcast have learned uh, tremendously throughout our conversation. Um, Kevin, if people want to learn more about you know the work you're doing today and the book you're releasing and yeah. some of your photography, where, where should they go? Well, so, so I, I have a website, which is my initials, KK. Dot org and there's all the cool tool stuff that I've been doing for 20 years. There's the five years of podcasts that we've been doing every week. We have our um, YouTube channels. We have a newsletter every week for six years on, that we recommend stuff. Um, so that's one place to go to. Um, also, um, the book that we're talking about, Vanishing Asia, I did a Kickstarter, which was long closed, but Amazon has copies of the book that they sell at below the cost that we can send it out. And I don't know how they do it. Don't ask me. It's, it's all, Amazon. <laughs> they're, they're getting, they're taking the, the discount, not me, but they are selling it and sending it with free prime shipping at a rate that I can't even, even imagine doing. So um, sometimes it's been below $200, which is just nice. amazing. Nice. So it's really worth it. There's three volumes. It weighs 30 pounds. You need to have a wow. prepare to have shelf space or make a <laughs> table out of it. And um, um, there are some copies left, so that would be great. And then the this little book will be out May 2nd, um, wherever you buy your books these days. And um, uh, I'm on the Kevin number two Kelly is my socials. I yeah. see where I'm posting my daily art for the fun of it there's no intention other than i just enjoy doing it hope you enjoy seeing it thank you so much kevin and I'll, again i'll put all the show notes down below with the links uh, i've been fred ranger if you enjoyed the show please make sure to rate it on apple Podcasts or spotify or wherever you're listening to this show and i wish you a very very pleasant remainder of your week and again i've been fred ranger please be happy, enjoy life, and enjoy the podcast. Cheers. Cheers.